want to just give a quick introduction into the chat box so that they can um, can kind of see who's in the room and feel free to look at the participants as well and you'll be able to see who's here. So I think we've got a few more people that we're waiting on, so I'm just going to give it a, a minute or so for everyone to join. I'm going to get started now then. I think we've got most people we're expecting, maybe a couple of couple more just waiting to join. Um, so if everyone can just mute for the time being, keep your screens off. I'm going to do the first kind of 15, 15 minutes or so of just talking through some of the work that CDC have been doing around short breaks and the coronavirus, some of the national kind of perspective. And then we'll have some time in the second half of the session for all of you to kind of ask questions share your thoughts and, and um, experiences of everything that's been going on locally so that we can hopefully think about how we can contribute all of these things in terms of moving things forward for um, kind of the summer holiday, which obviously has been raised throughout the session as something that everyone's quite um, concerned and anxious that we need to be planning next step for. So hopefully this session will be able to help with some of that. OK. So um, for those of you that don't know me, I'm Caroline Cody. I'm the Assistant Director for um, Social Care um, at the Council for Disabled Children. And really since um, the beginning of the, the pandemic, we've been working really closely with the department to understand the impact on access to short breaks for the children and young people that we're supporting. So um, we've talked a lot today already, and obviously you're all very, very aware of the, the changes around the SEN regulations and the timelines. We've heard from Andre, we've heard from uh, Lorraine and Nick about uh, all of those kind of um, aspects and the impact that they're having on practice. And what I wanted to flag in this session was actually the, the kind of overlap and the interaction with the, the changes to regulations in relation to social care. So these came about through the Adoption and Children Coronavirus Amendment Regulations 2020. So they came into force on the 24th of April. Um, it amends 10 existing pieces of regulation and expires on the 25th of September at this time, but may be renewed. And the significant changes, now these aren't only specific to short breaks, this is across the whole of social care, but I thought it was useful to, to have a bit of context here. So the significant changes include relaxing the duty to visit looked after children, um, which can now be conducted by phone or video where you're unable to visit within timescale. So this is really related to social workers' engagement with looked after children and can be now as soon as is reasonably practicable. Six monthly care plan reviews can now be held where reasonably practicable. Disabled children taking short breaks for more than 17 days no longer becomes looked after, but for 75 days in a year, that the short break rule in relation to, to looked after uh, status still applies. Temporary foster placements can now be up to 24 weeks and no longer need to be with someone connected to the child. Initial visits to private foster placements now only need to be as soon as is reasonably practicable. Children in children's homes can be deprived of their liberty in accordance with powers in Schedule 21 of the Coronavirus Act in very specific circumstances where there's a risk of, of infection. Um, and there are relaxations around holding both fostering and adoption panels. So across the sector, really, in the context of all children and young people who are vulnerable in the context of social care, there have been a number of challenges around how to ensure that children are still safeguarded at a time when potentially there are less checks and measures in place because they're not engaged with school um, necessarily in the same way that they may have been previously and how to ensure that those opportunities to 
um, intervene appropriately and provide support as necessary for all children and young people. There's also updated guidance for children's social care services, which was updated on the 6th of May and is still under review. And it remains in place only for as long as is needed. It doesn't amend primary legislation or working together, but it does provide guidance on adoption, on the adoption and children coronavirus amendment regulations that we were just talking about. So I guess the key things to note from the guidance are that the majority of statutory duties remain the same, that the amended powers should only be used where it's absolutely necessary with senior management oversight and where it's in line with safeguarding and welfare duties. Um, there's an acceptance that face to face contact may be replaced by phone or video calls, but inevitably that has its own challenges. Um, it prioritises local decision making, so including where visits may need to be held virtually or postponed. It provides information on circumstances where PPE should be used. Confirmed child protection conferences should go continue to go ahead even if they're held virtually rather than being postponed. The Child Safeguard and Practice Review Panel should still be notified of serious incidents within five working days. The 15 day rapid review of serious incidents should still be a target, but um, understanding that the current circumstances may make this more difficult. That court directed contact arrangements should continue, but where face to face contact is not possible should be virtual. And it provides further detail on issues for staffing in children's homes, issues around foster carers becoming unwell and adoption panels amongst other topics. Now, although some of these feel like they aren't, well, they aren't necessarily specific to children with um, SEN and disabilities. However, there are a lot of overlapping issues there around relaxations of duties, worries about safeguarding, and specifically thinking about sp support for disabled children and young people in the context of short breaks now. So we're gonna go on to think about what some of those regulations and changes mean and, and the overlap between the SEND uh, changes in the context of short breaks. So some of the challenges that have been raised to us recently is that there was some quite clear guidance at the beginning around supporting vulnerable children and young people during the coronavirus. Um, so the actions for educational providers and other partners, which clearly talks about in section 5.5, personal budgets and access to respite care or short breaks for children and young people with EHC plans. So this is the detail that's taken from that section of the guidance. So it talks about the fact that for children and young people with, a, with an EHC plan, the duties relating to personal budgets remain in place uh, as detailed in the SEND code of practice, that a child's parent or a young person has the right to request a personal budget when the local authority has completed an EHC needs assessment and confirmed that it will prepare an, a plan and that they may also request a personal budget during a statutory review of a plan. And we know that those things are anticipated to go ahead as, as planned. So then in terms of services for disabled children provided under Section 17 of the Children Act 1989, these would typically include short breaks for parent carers. So the local authority remains under a duty to provide these. Um, and although it's recognised that that may be challenging during the coronavirus outbreak, um, local authorities are to ensure that every effort is made to continue to provide this important support for families who need it. Where it's not possible for local authorities to arrange respite care for families as a result of circumstances related to coronavirus, then parents and carers and young people are encouraged to discuss that with the local authority, agree what alternative arrangements can be made. And that could include, so for example, local authorities considering whether making a personal budget or a direct payment available on a temporary basis might enable the family to secure alternative arrangements. Now, inevitably, I'm sure many of you are aware of the challenges that exist around direct payments and personal budgets for families. We know that actually even in normal times, it can be quite challenging for families to secure the support that they need for short break provision through direct payments. And actually at a time when there are far more limits on the access to the community, um, that inevitably is likely to be more challenging. So what we've really been trying to do at CDC in our work with the department through our role as strategic reform partner, is to really understand what is happening out there, what areas uh, and what services are managing to provide. Um, so as part of that, we've been exploring any conflicts that have been raised to us in the guidance. And so this is one of the big challenges that has come out of that, that kind of exploration of the guidance and some of the questions that have been raised through our FAQs. So this was the actions for schools during the coronavirus outbreak guidance, which at 24.4 talked about whether the re phased reopening would apply to out of school settings. 
So um, what this explains is that um, whilst at the time schools were preparing to welcome back some of their pupils on a phased basis from the 1st of June, this is not the case for out of school settings. And it explains here what out of school settings covers, um, which seems to include um, many, many of the community activities, clubs and holiday clubs that may have been um, providing short breaks. So this is something that we're in conversations with the department about at the moment, and we're thinking about how to unpick some of this guidance and look at what we need to do in terms of supporting families to access the short break provision that they need. Now, these types of out of school settings are potentially only one aspect of the whole myriad of different types of short breaks support that would be available in normal circumstances. So some of this work is about understanding what it is that we can think about and do differently that fits within the guidance that we've got available and in order to, to fit within the kind of individual risk assessment approaches that we're using in other settings. So whether that's about returning to school, whether that's about engaging with the community for exercise, it's about thinking through what are the things that can be done differently um, within the constraints of the guidance that we currently have and in order to ensure that we're making individual decisions for individual children on the basis of their needs. So a few of the example things to think about, which actually are examples in the guidance about, um, you know, uh, EHC provision outside of, of just social care and short breaks, but essentially are really relevant in the same context. So, you know, what can we do differently? What might be different? Where might the new provision take place? How might new provision take place? So is it online? Is it in smaller groups? How can we follow social distancing rules? And what does that look like? When might the provision take place? So it might happen more or less or at a different time of day. And who might carry it out? It might be a different person to normal. And here we're talking about uh, learning assistants instead of specialist therapists. But in terms of, of short breaks provision, we've heard some examples of where actually broader, wider family members are being engaged in, in direct payment support and things like that, which actually previously we may not have, have done in the same way. So what are the actual practice implications and what are areas doing? So we've done some um, research in terms of the impact on short break. Now, it was a very quick turnaround piece of work to gather some evidence for DfE in order to inform some of their next steps around planning for short breaks. So um, this just summarises a little bit of the people that we spoke to. So we had feedback from 13 Sendias services. Um, we analysed 54 of the emails that we received to our CDC FAQs email inbox. We had a survey um, which was which was not yet closed uh, around CDC members and the impact it was having on them delivering their services. Um, some detailed feedback and interviews with local authority, disabled children, social work teams, short break teams and commissioners. 11 local offer reps responded by the local offer network. We had feedback from the Disabled Children's Partnerships uh, survey, which we've heard mentioned earlier, and also feedback from kids in terms of the service provision that their services were able to make. And so initially what we'd found was that 55% of the providers responding to our survey had been able to continue to deliver only between 26 to 50% of their normal services. 28% of providers had been able to continue to deliver between 51 to 75% of their normal services. And 17% of providers have been able to continue to deliver almost all of their normal services. And often the, the difference there essentially is organisations which are essentially providing advice and information to families versus organisations that are providing direct support to children and young people in terms of um, short break provision. So some of the examples that have been shared with us, though, in terms of um, looking at alternative approaches. Um, so if we start with the kind of direct payments options, so what has been happening differently in some areas is the flexibility around the way that direct payments have been able to be used. So actually some areas are working with families in order to support them to use direct payments differently based on individual needs. So thinking about whether sensory equipment um, can be purchased for in the home or the garden, thinking about um, activity equipment, um, so trampolines, bikes, garden games, but also then thinking about those families who perhaps don't have access to open space in the same way and thinking about craft, arts, activities, um, things that children and young people are able to engage with at home um, and similarly then thinking about provision of computer devices, tablets, iPads, things that can support children and young people to engage with something more independently um, whilst family are able to, to kind of do other things. 
We've then got some group activity stuff. Now, this inevitably has been much more challenging during the pandemic, as I'm sure you've, you're all experiencing in your own um, day to day work. So some really interesting things that have been happening. Um, we've got one area who've been in touch with us and we're developing some learning examples with them at the moment who have um, reduced uh, and changed the model of their short break service. So one of the things that they did in order to, to start establishing how to operate in the pandemic was that they, they very early on um, conducted some really detailed analysis and rag rated the top 30 children across each. So it's a, a by bar or so across each of the authority areas rag rated the top 30 children in each area who they felt were at significant um were likely to have significant needs in terms of support during the pandemic were unlikely to be engaged be able to engage with uh, school and who were likely to need whose, whose families were likely to struggle and actually as part of this they were identified and they worked quite quickly in order to open um settings for example in special schools uh, where the, the facilities weren't being used or in other community settings so a number of these areas are areas that are fortunate enough to have in-house um, kind of uh, provision for disabled children and young people and open them with significantly reduced numbers so for example four children and four support workers in a setting that would previously have been for maybe 20 to 30 children and young people at a time but to split the sessions down so instead of having you know uh, 20 to 30 children for a full day at a time they're splitting the sessions into three hour sessions having four children in each session twice a day um, keeping workers and children in bubbles of support um, and then in other areas, there's a, a specialist playground, which was part of a special school um, outside setting um, where they have been enabling families to book the playground for an hour, having specialist cleaners on site. It's booked by one family at a time. It's then cleaned and disinfected thoroughly before the next family comes on um, and enabling some of those things to happen in a, a way that it enables social distancing and even in some circumstances enables shielding within a household to continue. So um, uh, we then got online activities and I think we've had mixed feedback about some of these. I think they've been one of the easiest things to adapt and deliver, but have been really challenging in some circumstances for families. It can often require a lot of support for children and young people to be engaged in those online activities. So it doesn't necessarily deliver the same level of break that some of the other things can do. So there's a lot more to think about there in terms of, of next steps around these things. So what I'd like to do now, we've got about 19 minutes left of this session before you've got a short break. Um, it would be really great. I'm going to come out of this screen now so that I can actually see the, the chat messages because I don't know if people have been posting anything while I've been on here and just check if there are any questions or anything to pick up. But it would be great um, if any of you have any examples that you would be happy to share, to talk about or that you'd be willing to share with colleagues to think about actually what it is that happens um it, that's happening in your local area what have been the challenges and what have been some of the successes in terms of delivering short breaks at the moment okay is there anyone who'd like to share something if you want to either just pop in the chat that you'd like to share something or raise a hand we're a relatively small group hopefully i'll be able to spot if any hands are up okay julie do you want to go ahead um yeah i'll, I'll share some of what we've been doing in wakefield but my main issue in terms of the presentation is about the group work my understanding and i've checked numerous times with the dfe is that you can't mix children um, that are not already from the same family or not already in a, a particular bubble in schools. So I don't understand how the group work could go on um, on that basis. So I think just to respond to that, I think the particular groups of children that they're talking about there were children that weren't accessing school at the time. So they weren't already part of a school bubble. And I agree that is something that's been raised to us as well. And we're currently working with the department. So the next steps around this are that we're, we're, we've asked the department to review the guidance around um, the, the kind of social care guidance that's saying short break should still be happening, the guidance around not opening out of school provision, which is saying that it shouldn't happen, to understand actually what's 
what the implications of that are for short breaks and how we can clarify some of those issues. And we're hoping that that will be, uh, that is something we're working very closely on with developing them at the moment. As part of that, we we as CDC have been asked um, to put out a call for evidence and information from areas who are currently delivering short breaks in any format to look for examples of what is working for families to understand how we can um, marry up that practice with what's happening in the guidance. So there will be something that will be coming out um, in the coming weeks. I don't have an exact timeline for it yet, Julie, but I will make sure that everyone is aware of it as soon as it's um, as soon as it's ready to go. And if anyone on this group is interested in sharing some examples as part of that, um, my colleague Emma's on this call, so she she'll be happy to share the learning example template with everyone after the session. If anyone's got anything they'd like to share as part of that. Whilst that's useful, we're heading into the summer holidays and if we don't get information quick about who you can mix with, and my understanding still with the guidance was that if you're not in a, a you know the same kind of group of families, you still cannot mix, certainly not till recently, about group work. So I am a little bit confused. If we don't get information out fairly quickly, it won't be possible to run groups during the summer because they, they do take quite a lot of organising and arranging. And we're desperate to do that, but we do need the authorisation to kind of go ahead with that. Um, in terms of short breaks in Wakefield, we've been still doing overnights. We did a reduced services of, of overnights. We did prioritise, like somebody has already said. We have had slots within playgrounds, equipment, and for some um, children and young people, we've opened up school playgrounds as well at a particular time slot for them to go in. We've used the budget very creatively, I think, in Wakefield. So we've bought um, garden equipment for those that are shielding. I've bought Netflix vouchers. I've, we've done um, takeaway vouchers in terms of, and we've been flexible about, you know, in some cases, allowing family members to do the kind of PA work around um, individual children and young people. So we've got a whole host of things going on, but we know that what we're doing at the moment is not really promoting the social aspect which a lot of the children and young people are struggling with. And that's why I'm really keen and passionate to get kind of clarification about the group work, really. OK, thanks, Julie. That's really helpful. It's definitely something that will be taken back again after this session. So I will make sure that in the next conversations we have with the department, we're really um, reiterating the urgency of decisions around this and, and the urgency of guidance to go out to support people to prepare for the holidays. Did anyone else want to share anything? Anyone who's posted anything in the, the chat, welcome to speak and share your thoughts. I can see there's a lot of um, kind of questions coming up in the chat box, just kind of essentially reflecting the same things, the real challenge of, of the bubbles and, um, and understanding that. And I think, you know, I think inevitably you're right that the, it's all very well to to be kind of anticipating an announcement at some point in the future but actually in terms of that planning it needs to happen now and particularly if planning is needing to happen around um either trying to match bubbles for children who may have been in a particular bubble within school settings um or otherwise that's something that needs to happen as a matter of urgency has anyone got any suggestions about how they could see that potentially could work in terms of planning or any any thoughts about um Um, Caroline, can I share something that we've been doing um, in Cambridge and Peterborough? It's more for the children with complex health needs. Um, yeah, so we've been working we've worked with our local authority colleagues to look at we know we've got a reduced um, overnight short break provision because of the environment and also the the staff groups available within the within the local authority um short break overnight short breaks and in Cambridgeshire and Peterborough we um, the CCG um, grant funds into the um, overnight short breaks to um, uh, support the health needs of children um, we know that we've got families who are shielding and their children have very complex health needs um, but we we have children with continuing care needs and their their care packages have, have largely continued and we've worked really you know we work with families to think of um uh, flexible ways to continue to deliver those continuing care packages um but we're also really um aware that, that some of the families that are shielding especially our single parent families are really really beginning to struggle now and they are at the some of them are at breaking point so we've um 
we've worked with our local authority to produce a um, a pathway for a, a clinical care pathway, um, and CCG's funded some um, additional, um, well, funded a, a, a plan, business plan with our local hospice. So we've created, we, we try not to call it hospice to not put people off, but we've created um, the Each Milton Hub, and that hub will be able to provide um, support for families um, without having to go through a sort of continuing care assessment process. We've got a fast track continuing care assessment just for audit purposes. Um, but in that way, we can actually provide um, some respite and overnight provision for children that wouldn't necessarily either um, go to our local authority overnight short break provision because they have other care um, packages in place or where families um, prefer a more kind of health sort of nurse led um, service. So that's that's um, we've just literally in, in a mobilisation phase of that at the moment. But that's been a really lovely piece of work with the local authority. And we're just hoping that over the next six months um, that that, um, you know, the families that have expressed the real need for something that's not you know not going back to normal really taking into account their fears around um, their shielded children and, and keeping them clinically safe um, and making sure that they get some sort of break yeah that sounds really interesting it'd be it would be good to hear some more about how you've developed that Siobhan if it was possible to um if you were if you were happy to share some of that with us yeah, that we're doing. That's brilliant yeah. Um, I've got a few hands up now, so I'm going to go um, to uh, Zara first and then to Lisa and then Julie, have you got your hands up again or is or is it still up from earlier? But either way, happy to come to you um, afterwards. So Zara, did you want to go ahead now? Uh, yeah, I just wanted to pick up on a couple of things. So there's um, conversations ongoing around the use of school facilities or the use of school staff and utilising school bubbles. Locally, we've had the local authority quite clearly um, reiterate that this is optional for schools and there is absolutely no expectation for schools to open up any holiday time provision or anything like that, which is great in the sense of schools, if they need a break, can have a break. But when we're looking at the access to short breaks and providing that support, the ideal scenario is that we maintain the school social bubble system because that is what inevitably is going to be in place from September, whether it be the same as it is now or slightly adapted. Inevitably, it will be a social bubble system. Um, we have had an example where the special school in our area actually utilised the local residential short breaks provider who actually closed down their facility for a short period of time until we figured out what was going on. Um, and they were going into the school setting and using those school bubbles as a way of delivering the respite care and the support that those children were usually getting. And they increased the offer to children who hadn't been assessed for those services, but were clearly in need of that. If we can find a way of replicating that, that would be great. But I think this clarity around what the social bubble system is going to look like in schools moving forward will give providers a better idea of how they can utilise that, but also having a conversation with the local school systems around who are open, who are willing to support and enable and facilitate some sort of short break system. Um, another observation that I'd like to make if I can is around the um, guidance that came out a couple of weeks ago around the access to activities and leisure facilities and how things are slowly going to change around outdoor activity spaces um, and I'm really mindful that short breaks providers could potentially tap into and develop relationships with providers who have more expansive outdoor space that they could use in more socially um, acceptable distancing and all that sort of stuff but where does where does that actually sit legally with the guidance for the providers themselves, because looking at the two different sets of guidance, they could overlap and marry quite beautifully. But actually, from a legal stance, would providers be held to account in breach of because they're utilising guidance that isn't necessarily written for them to be able to deliver their services more effectively and more creatively? And I think that's a really helpful point, Zara. So one of the things that we have have gone back to and one of the things that we're working on the department with at the moment, and one of the first things we said when the, the kind of reopening uh, of schools guidance came out was that actually there, there are two challenges around delivering short breaks at the moment. One is around providers confidence in knowing how and when to reopen and how to keep children and their staff and others safe. 
Um, and the other is around parental confidence in supporting their children back into those environments and having that confidence that their children are safe and cared for in the way that, that the guidance says that they need to be. So I think what we are, our, our ask of the department at the moment and what we hope that they're working towards is something that brings together all the other pieces of guidance and explains for local authorities and short break providers how that guidance needs to be interpreted in the context of reopening short breaks and what the examples are that we can find nationally that might support people to do things in a different way. And I think thinking about where things have been done differently that people feel could actually have some um, some benefit and some long-term impacts beyond uh, the kind of pandemic and beyond uh, reopening and, and social distancing and actually how can we maintain some of the things that have worked well and some of the things have been mentioned by, by both yourself and Siobhan which have also been around process which is actually speeding up decision making and risk assessment around who are the people that need this most opening up services where possible to families that may not previously have been um, eligible under under systems that were in place pre um, pre COVID but also I think really really ensuring that both providers and parents have that confidence to be able to start to re-engage in things in the right way and that is absolutely what we are pushing um, pushing for and working with the department on developing at the moment and working across the sector to try and get some of that other uh, kind of support and feedback. Um, okay, so can I come to Lisa Taylor now? Please, you've got your hand up. Hi. Um, yeah, so basically for, for me, it's around the lack of guidance in relation to the, 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 the bubble. Um, the providers that we're working with currently in Lancashire are keen to start to resume some of those services. And what we, what we have looked at is, is small groups so we can enable more sessions a day um, in, in these bubbles, but we're not getting any any guidance as such. One, when are we anticipating getting that guidance? Because if it isn't going to work for us, then we're not going to have very much time to think flexibly in terms of meeting some of these vulnerable children's needs over the summer. Um, so things like Netflix vouchers, access to, to an hour, um, you know, school equipment will be fantastic. But my, my worry is schools are going to close and we're going to have buildings and equipment that isn't going to be available and families just just sat at home um, not knowing what what what's happening yeah i i think they're all really valid concerns and actually to be honest Lisa, i think almost almost what i would um seek to do is request from all of you to say wh when do we need this guidance what is the latest that this can happen for anything to work over the summer and that we need to then go back and feed that in to the department because actually as you say it's no good us working um, for the next three weeks on publishing something that doesn't give anyone any time to plan for anything so I think it, it's really important to understand from you as part of this session what, what when are we talking about you know and and how are we are there things that perhaps uh, we could pull together now out of guidance that exists to say these are some things that definitely can happen but also the point is understood that actually the key the key issue here is about group group sessions group support socialization for children and young people that have been missing that for a long time now and understanding how we can scale up um, anything that has been done within the, the constraints of the guidance at this time See, because what we're literally in the process of doing at the moment is we're putting together a, a bit of a snappy survey going out to parents next week in terms of understanding the impact COVID's had on them and, and, and what their confidence levels are to actually understand demand. Um, we operate a, a short break service to hundreds and hundreds of children and if we get a really positive response, and I'm sure we will, and I'm sure we've probably got even more children and young people that need it who've never accessed the service but I feel if we're doing that we're already putting parents we're getting them ready to look at delivering a service but we might not actually deliver that service so I'm, I'm concerned about that really that we're going to be putting families hopes up and um, we're going to be offering possibly a two-hour break it's not a lot but it's more than what these children have had um, since since lockdown 23rd of March so any anything will be greatly appreciated. 
Okay, we'll definitely make sure that message goes back in loud and clear. Um, thank you, Lisa. So I've got hands up from uh, Jessica Moore now. Jessica, would you like to share? Yeah, it was just uh, to reiterate those comments that Lisa's just made, but also just in terms of what we're doing in Sunderland, we've done our survey with parents and carers and they've clearly said that whilst there's some reticence about group based sessions, that for those children with particularly complex needs, they really feel that they need something like that over the summer because that, you know, Netflix vouchers and all that we can do. But families are clearly saying to us that they need something else over the summer and that the lack of clarity is actually causing both them and their children some great anxiety. So really in answer to your question about timescales, I think somebody in the chat said last month would have been ideal. I think just to, to agree with that, we need it as soon as possible. So I think what's really helpful about this session is being able to pull out some of the significant impact that the delay to guidance is having, not only on providers and planning and local authorities in terms of commissioning services for the summer, but also in terms of the impact on families and children and young people about understanding what's going to be expected and how to, to plan um, for themselves for the summer and to have that confidence that there, there may be support available. Um, I, I'm conscious of the time, so um, if, if there's anyone else who's got a final comment, I'm very happy to take one last comment before the break. But just to reassure everyone, everything that's been talked about today will be collated and fed back um, into the department as part of the work that we're doing with them on this and to really kind of um, stress the, the vital urgency around getting out some, um, some messages around this as soon as possible. Okay. Right, I'll let you guys go. I think there's a, a 10 minute um, kind of tea or coffee break. Sorry, we can't provide for you on this occasion, but please, please do take 10 minute comfort break. And then the next um, workshop starts at 3.50. So you should have all your logons for that. Um, it's been great to speak to everyone. Thank you for your time today. And we will also make sure that all of the, the presentation slides and information goes out to everyone after the session. Thanks very much, everybody. Um, Caroline, can you hear me? Yeah, I'm going to stop. I can't hear you. I'm just going to stop recording now. OK, and go into the next one.